Fix it. We have audio just in time for me to get my whiteboard out. I was ready to do a whole interview on a whiteboard. <laughs> Welcome to World Builders Weekly, everyone. Hopefully you can hear us, see us. Looks like chat has got us. It's good to see you all. Thank you for your patience. We are learning and, and putting OBS on new computers and uh, yeah, you know, never a show without a couple technical difficulties to start it. But yes, the stained glass behind Heather, hold on just a second because we have the artist's name. It's called Classic by Nenuel, as seen on DeviantArt. Uh, and it is delightfully appropriate for the conversation today. Oh, <laughs> the, the background never wants to cooperate quite properly. Um, it's, it's really great. So let's get right into it. My name is Jamie. I'm the director of outreach or community engagement or something like that for World Builders. Uh, every week here on World Builders Weekly, we're bringing you the latest news, treasures, deals uh, from the market, new products from the market. We got trivia. And uh, today we are so lucky. I am going to geek the heck out with our guest, Heather Slutsky. Welcome, Heather. Hi, thank you very much. I am glad to be here today. So excited. So we're going to get through trivia super quick. Uh, last week's question was in the 1976 American science fiction action film, Logan's Run, what was the name of the ceremony used to maintain equilibrium by killing people? And what at what age were you expected to participate? So the answer is carousel and 30 years old. So, sorry guys, gotta go. Uh, I haven't seen this film, but it is a classic sci-fi. So if you are a sci-fi fan, hopefully you sent your question or your answer into one of our social medias. If you want this week's uh, question, please don't say it in chat, put it in uh, a DM on Twitter, a DM on Instagram, basically message us or email us and we will enter you for our trivia prize. So this week's trivia question is, what was the name of the 1977 post-apocalyptic film, which was loosely based on the 1969 novel with the same name? Remember, no comments in chat, just DM us. Okay. I think that was our fastest announcements in trivia ever, because I'm just so excited to talk. Uh, so our guest today is Heather Slutsky, who weaves together compassionate healthcare education, supportive workplace environments, and a view of holidays and events that I personally find incredibly refreshing. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Heather. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. And speaking of geeks and their own holidays, may the fourth be with you. And with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's... <laughs> That's my favorite response. Um, <laughs> you know, it is cheeky, but it has really become kind of a mainstream recognized holiday, hasn't it? It certainly is getting more traction as a day that needs acknowledgement and, and creates a kind of space of its own. I thought a Star Wars question would be too obvious, guys. I'm sorry. I should have done a Star Wars question. Chat was calling me out for having a trivia question that wasn't Star Wars on May the 4th. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. What, Heather, let's start from like the basics. What's your proudest geek moment? Where's your, your geek hybrid and events? Okay, so I live in North Georgia and there is a little thing that happens here on Labor Day called Dragon Con, which for anybody who's not familiar, 40,000 of the nerdiest people you have ever met take over five hotels in Atlanta. And I learned a long time ago, the best place to be in a parade was in it. That it's much easier to see a parade from inside it than from <laughs> the side of the street. And on Saturday of Dragon Con, there is this huge costume parade. So my son and I were in the parade. And at the time he was five. Okay. And cool. when you are in costume and in that parade, but you are from different nerd universes, they put you at the very front with all the fancy dragons. So he was dressed as the Green Lantern and I was dressed as an intern from Night Vale. And so we were at the very front. With having a kid that young, 
he and I had talked a lot about what we would do if he got separated. And so the whole right. plan was that he should find anybody else with a child, like any yeah. parent, any place if they were walking with a kid and we got separated, my phone number was written on the inside of his arm. He was just supposed to go up to people and be like, Ooh. yeah, I remember every parent like, there. <laughs> yeah. Every parent there has got a plan. So this family is getting a spot by in front of the parade. They're walking around their smallest. There's like five kids and two adults. Their smallest gets mesmerized by one of those multi person Chinese, like new year's dragons or ones yeah, I think of for new yeah, year's. Yeah. And he just goes like zombie. He just bonk and is so mesmerized by this dragon. And his parents don't see it. Uh oh. And they are walking in a hurry, trying to get in place for the parade. And I yell, Dad! And the guy stops because it's that parent voice. Right. The parent. Yeah. And he turns around and I was like, Count your kids. And I like watched his head move. And realize he was one short. And <laughs> right. I was like, over the there. Panic rising. Yeah. And so my proudest geek moment was that I was so hyper fixated on like keeping track of my own kid that I saw this one kid not end up yeah. lost at the start of the Dragon Con parade. Um, so that's my biggest, proudest like nerd moment. Is, you were a, a real life superhero there for a moment. I, I feel like for a brief moment, I, I could have done you, that. You yeah. leapt into action and you <laughs> saved the day. But really that, I mean, it's especially like getting lost in the grocery store as a little kid is one thing. Getting lost in a costume parade might be a little scarring for life. Oh yeah. Just think of all that the movies really you would no terrible. longer be able to watch. <laughs> so we're tied so dragon con you mentioned taking over like five hotels your your sort of another bread and butter thing for you is working with the joko cruise folk um so convention lo lobby hangouts cosplay groups the cruise are these do you see these as like the seeds of holidays so i think that when you're thinking about celebrations and holidays you have the kind of things that you do for yourself for your immediate family you have the things that you do in your community, whether it is your faith community or your nerd community or whatever. And then you have stuff that you can do at kind of an organizational level. What impressed me so much this year about the Joko Cruise was how even through all of the technology, it was still so clear that those people were friends who needed this time with their friends mm -hmm. to to think about what this year has been like, to daydream about what next year might be, to throw back to all of the jokes that have been funny for all time. So right. in their own way, Dragon Con, Joko, all of those sorts of things do have that sense of community around them. That is one of the things I think the internet has made possible Yeah, is that I am the only Doctor Who fan I know in person, basically. Right. I have a lot of people I can talk to outside of that community. I could go to Gallifrey, you know, I, there's a lot of that sort of thing that can happen, mm -hmm. but that's easier because of the community that happens through the internet. Yeah, the internet has changed a lot in terms of, I think just those social groups um, and, and being able to connect with folks who are like interested in just the exact same thing that you are. And to me, a lot of celebrations that we participate in mainstream, we participate in out of like route, out of habit and out of commercialism that, right. you know, go, go buy something green and get drunk on St. Patrick's Day. And it's like, well, do, do we even know what St. Patrick's Day is, right? Um, so what, what's your- And tomorrow you, is a great example of that. Yes. <laughs> Will you tell us a little bit about that? How sort of like the perception and what could be a better world? So, so tomorrow, Cinco de Mayo, the most, probably one of the most reliable business days for Mexican restaurants in the United States. And there is the buildup of the idea that it is of deep cultural heritage for parts of the Hispanic community, specifically the Mexican community. And uh, 
for some, maybe sometimes, but not in the mylar balloon shape, like a taco kind of variety. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not a, um, <laughs> it's, it's a little overblown for what it is originally. Uh, but we like to do that kind of thing. Fourth of July. <laughs> and I think, I think when we look for celebrations, when we look at what what makes a meaningful celebration thinking about things that either we do or don't have a big belief in right now but that come out of what can I do that is meaningful emotional for me as an individual for my immediate family for my community for my organization that doesn't go on Instagram what if you never took a picture of it right what if you never had to shop for decorations what if you looked at the way you wanted something to feel yeah, and then built something around that? So you take something like May the 4th and mm -hmm. maybe that is a, turns into for you personally a celebration where you've been to watch the movies because you and your dad always used to and your dad is gone now. Right. Or maybe it is a family get together. Or maybe it is when you and your circle of friends try to do some activism to do good in the world and bring that yeah. spirit forward. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can do just playing off of this that don't necessarily, I may, I have, I have <laughs> the correct <laughs> font um, and all of that today. But really you can take this day and think about like, okay, these movies mean so much to me for a reason what amplifies that reason in a way that is meaningful for me. Yeah. And that's how it moves to a ritual. That's how it moves to a celebration. And that may be something that you create outward giving towards, or it may be a place where you really, really take care of yourself. Can I riff just a little? Absolutely. Longer? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, at Joko Cruise, because that was about a month ago now, um, we were talking about what a reintegration celebration would look like. All of us are kind of like cracking open the door, looking around, figuring out if it's possible to get together with our friends again. And there was a lot of talk about what we wanted that to look like. And in the aftermath of that conversation, I realized the thing that a lot of us are inclined to do in celebration, which is get together and eat, mm -hmm. it's probably not the thing yet because we're all going to come out of this at our own pace. Yeah. And so come on over to my house, come inside, take your mask off while I breathe on you shoulder to shoulder and we all share a meal. Yeah. Since there's food in front of us, everybody can breathe. Yeah, it's just it, before last year, people were we going to come to that. It is stressful, right? But right now, there's a varying degree of stress about that. So if everybody gets together and goes and plays, you know, frisbee golf and bags, and and there is food there that you can approach however you want to, that's a different way to do reintegration. And as time goes on do we look at that as an annual celebration among friends that is, gosh, do you remember how scary that was and how hard we worked and how weird it was? And now we are back together and two years or five years or 10 years from now, this is the day that we'll all get together because yeah. we love each other and we all made it through safe. I think it's so important to acknowledge these big, life passages, whether they're individual or communal, and by continuing to acknowledge it, I think it helps us remember those lessons that we learned of appreciating our friends and like, you know, maybe you're not the biggest hugger in the world, but eight to 12 months of no human contact can affect a person. Like <laughs> yeah. the, the, I think that at least for me, the most natural inclination, like you said, was to get together and have like a huge meal, like a celebratory potluck with all my friends and you're right it's kind of like oh okay we have to see the world differently now right. uh, but something that I've noticed at least Gen Z doing a bit um I'm I use I'm a millennial who uses TikTok as like a way to see what the hip kids are, are up to and they are 
throwing the coolest costume picnics and the coolest creative events with their their friends um and it kind of intersects that really niche like i like gravity falls and you know here are the people like you can celebrate all parts of of your community which i think is amazing absolutely um, and you know, i am a gen xer who is on tiktok to yeah to see what the youngsters are doing these days they're fascinating they really it's are. so fun but so but talking about tiktok so that was one of the things there were a couple of things in the spring that really stood out to me one i watched a ton of adults desperate to have proms and graduations for their kids mm -hmm. and that was one of the places where i really started thinking about it investigating celebration differently because although within specific cultures there are coming of age things mm -hmm. there aren't really for like baseline america yep except for prom and high school graduation yep. and when i thought about what it would be like to what it would be like to have a kid miss the part where they got in their tuxedo or in their gown mm -hmm. and looked like an adult and walked out of the house potentially for the first non-curfew night of their life that's a lot for an adult to miss who is trying to get ready to watch their child move yeah. into the adult world it's as that's much of a ritual for the parent as it is for the kids absolutely and we don't have anything to replace that with the other thing, and this is the thing that I saw on TikTok, was as people, um, if I were to say the the TikTok song that transgender people announced their new name to, there is like one specific song that they do that kind of reintroduction of themselves to the world with. And it was beautiful. And I would hear the first two or three beats of that song and be like, somebody's got a new name yeah that's my exact reaction to those tiktoks and i'm on that corner of tiktok too where it's you know renaming myself claiming myself and that's again something that we don't have really a standard celebration for but there's no reason we couldn't have name days right exactly and i think that in some ways that would be way easier than having to go up to each person and be like hi I don't know how you're going to react to this, but here we go. But to yeah. be able to send out an invitation that is like, I am claiming a name on May the 4th. Yeah. You can and, come over and... to my house. We'll, we'll do all this stuff. There will be food and wine. And you can ask somebody later if you can't figure out how to emotionally be there for me right now. But that's what the first thing that came to my mind was that allows your friends and family who are allies to you, who are supportive and, you know, because you're not going and making every single individual connection, other people can help and insulate you or explain things to them or even just normalize it. Right. And so when Aunt Trudy calls and is like, what's this invitation to a name day, for, you know, a, a name claiming ceremony for, you know, this this kid in our family. And then the parent can say, oh, well, my kid is trans and that's, this is what this means. And so that kid, you know, the individual doesn't have the onus of every single conversation. Yep. I think it would be not only like it, it is removing trauma and creating empowerment at the same time. Right. So that one is a particular soft spot for me is like, why don't we adopt those um, late in life changes in more yep. official way because we do for weddings right i think that's right. probably our biggest ceremony but even weddings often are more um expected ritual than meaningful ritual right how do and you approach it oh, go ahead. so so where i approach it from really anchors in what happens what do you create that nobody else sees and there is a lot to be said and warnings to be put up absolutely about the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation and all of that sort of thing. And if you're gonna light a candle, figure out why you're lighting a candle. Are you lighting a candle to, because 
that's how you know something is special. Are you lighting a candle because you are taking something away? Are you lighting a candle because it used to be dark and now it's light? There are a thousand images that can go with lighting a candle, but know why you're doing it. Right. And figure out what in a celebration or a ritual you're creating for yourself, what your starting emotion is and what your ending emotion is. And so if I am doing something for myself for the new year, am I adding things to my life? Am I saying goodbye to things? What am I doing that I want to create a ritual for? If my if I'm doing this, even at an organizational level for places that I have worked before, I would do stuff on the fiscal new year, which was never mm-hmm. January 1st, because right. if I want my folks to feel connected to my organization, they need to understand why on what feels like a fairly random day, all of a sudden we have like this whole batch of essentially new year's resolutions right. coming out the 1st of October. I do, uh, what? Yeah. That's so, not one where we do not re- resolutions. Right. You can only it's, do resolutions for the first two weeks of the year, and then you have to discard them. <laughs> <laughs> and so for everything from personal stuff like weddings or funerals, all the way through that, like organizational thing, what do you want people to feel? What do you want them to be connected to? Why would you do any of the symbolic things that you are doing? One of the things that I do locally is I do um, weddings and funerals for people. Mm -hmm. So I help people build those ceremonies to start out with and what people include in that, especially when there are small weddings is really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And it is never the, I now pronounce you, you know, Mr. And Mr. Da, 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 that gets somebody's attention. It's that's never the part that makes them cry. The right. part is where they're seen and believed and held gently by the yeah. universe. That's the part that makes them cry. It's yeah, there is a magic to those moments that are truly reverent of not just we're doing the celebration. Look, we got a cake, but is like we're our hearts are in this. And that can go for any type of event. You can put your heart in a wedding and you can put your heart in a, a geek get together, you know, post-COVID event. It's all about that intention. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for people kind of who like, maybe have never thought about, I could have an event or have a holiday. Where's the starting point? Do you think for people? I think the starting point for that is that, that identifying what feeling it is that you want to do. Is it something that is internal or is it something that is outward reaching? And if you take May the 4th and turn that into a community service day, Mm -hmm. you know, you can take that and be like, okay, this has been meaningful to me. So I want to wear my favorite worn out Star Wars shirt and I want to go out into the world and I want to fight for the rebellion. Right. Then, then you start to get the makings of something. And I think at a corporate level, you know, at an organizational level, One of the places that we fall down is that we stop making it for the people it's designed for. So if we're doing, uh, most of my professional work for a long time has been in hospitals and last week was patient experience week. And once we put on social media, it's patient experience week here, look at Jamie doing all of this great patient experience stuff. We're not saying thank you to Jamie anymore. We're saying, look at how great we are. You're marketing, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. you're marketing. And Jamie's smart and knows it. Yep. And so I think that's one of the tricky things is that even though it is so tempting to go and get Mylar taco balloons, and even though it is so tempting to post it on Facebook and Instagram Mm -hmm. to show like, see, we're engaged with our folks, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff takes away from that intentional part of it. Yeah, I can turn May the 4th into a community service holiday and the people that I am providing service to never need to know I do it because I got taught service and the resistance through Star Wars. I can just do it. 
it's valid. It's, it yep. doesn't matter if it's from a geek source or a religious source or a family tradition source or this feels right for me source. Um, you know, and, and I, especially like you said, with corporate stuff, how many times have we collectively gone to some like team development meeting and done icebreakers and all of these things? And it, it's just like, you know, this is not for you. It's to look right. like you're being taken care of, but you're not really being taken care of in those situations. Yeah. But when I think back on exercises I've done with teams that were really thoughtfully put together and had a specific goal, like getting everyone on the same page or just increasing general rapport, when you really specify, this is what the outcome we're looking for is, not just like employee appreciation day, but to make employees feel valued, feel like they're contributing to the organization, then you, you know, you can really start getting into the meat of something. And like you said, it goes organizational and individual. You can decide, right. you can celebrate a holiday that literally nobody else knows about. Right. You and can I just think make one for you. The other part of this that I have, I have come to understand as, as a Gen Z who is maturing in this world is that you have to look for the parts of it that you love. And I'll use food as an example. Okay. So you're doing a community thing. It's going to have food. And, and honestly, as I was thinking about this last night, it also kind of plays into for the creative folks who watch this sort of thing, when you're actually world building and you're trying to figure out what the big thing is going to be. So when you're thinking about food for your community thing that you're doing, what's your target? Do you want the food to be the food that your grandmother used to make so that the house smells like your grandmother's house used to smell? Do you want it to be the nouveau Thanksgiving meal where it is the never pink. the same meal twice? Um, I live in a house with a vegan, a vegetarian, and me. And if I could live on steak and cheese for the rest of my life, I would. It would be a short life, but it would be a. It would be a <laughs> grateful be a happy and one. happy one. <laughs> And so Thanksgiving for us can't be about the food anymore. Yeah. But when you're designing those things, like, do I want everybody to bring their own piece of affection potluck style? Do I love to cook? Do I really enjoy three weeks of planning and an $800 grocery bill and not sleeping for three days so that I can, right. so that I can show my love to the people I love via this elaborate thing. Like it's not just what food should we have, right? It is how does food or lighting or music or games or whatever, um, supply what we need to get the feeling that we want. And I think at least in my, the, the way that this first sort of hits me is that it, empowers the things that we do to be more inclusive because if it's not about the food it's okay if you have a food allergy it's okay if you you know you don't you you can center on the things that are are so important um and that will allow for more flexibility in in you know maybe somebody who is used to going to a thanksgiving dinner just absolutely hates that food and needs like a spicy food or something, but they can bring a dish to this, you know, group event that bonds everybody closer together. Right. In the end. So, you know, I think that taking the critical eye to some of our traditions and going, wait, what do we actually want out of this is a really valuable uh, practice. Yeah. I and keep, oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go right ahead. I, I was moving on to the next question. So, okay. Okay. Um, but it's sort of related, uh, to, to that attitude. Um, you recently had Casey Davis on your podcast. Yes. Huge fan. <laughs> <laughs> Huge fan. Um, she is, her, her book's amazing. Her methods are amazing. If you don't know who Casey Davis is, she does struggle care, which, um, creates, it offers a framework of morally neutral home care and self-care. And it is 
life changing. It is a revolution. It, it is really is. a revolution. Yes. And I see, like, I genuinely see your work as like the holidays, rituals, events version of that reanalysis, that, that total shakeup of what's expected. Um, what sort of principles do you feel like your work shares with Casey and how is that conversation? How was it? <laughs> so first Casey is absolutely as lovely as you would hope she would be to have a conversation with. She was, um, she was absolutely tremendous. And I was so delighted as somebody who's running essentially a first season podcast right now. Um, it was, it was an intimidating thing to reach out to her and be like, so I really like you. Will you be my friend for 45 minutes, please? Right. Um, I think where the work overlaps is that idea that just because it has always been that way doesn't mean that has to be the truth in your home. So I have a theory about why nobody buys modern holiday albums. Would you like to hear the theory about why Absolutely nobody? Absolutely, I would. Because lots of people make Christmas albums. Yeah. And we all still listen to Bing Crosby. Like Bing Crosby still hits the charts at Christmas time every year. And I think that is because we have tied the look of our family's face during the holidays, listening to that music. That's what we bring forward for holiday music mm -hmm. is that we, for those of us who have, and I certainly do fond family memories, like you put that eight track on and my grandmother who on the joyful grumpy balance was a little tip towards grumpy. Um, <laughs> that was such a polite way. <laughs> <laughs> but you take, she gets lighter listening to that music. Yeah. And the Backstreet Boys Christmas album doesn't do that for me. Like right. it doesn't connect in that same way. So what I learned from Casey through TikTok and through her book, because I also agree it is an awesome book. And through my personal conversation with her was that that's okay. That I can listen to Bing Crosby because my mom listened to Bing Crosby because my grandmother got light when mm -hmm. she heard it. Right. And that's a different target than I need a new Christmas CD. Right. Now I it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Now it makes sense when my, when my, the artist of my heart makes a new CD for me to do that because it's okay for my son who has very little memory of my grandmother. Like I don't have to hand this down for right. all time. Yeah. But the Bing Crosby records was probably some of the first music people owned in their home that was from somebody else. Yeah. Like you're looking at record sales. There's not a whole lot before that that would still continue to get handed down. And so that's become a generational thing, which is great. But we only get to keep it if we want it. So bringing that up a lot of, as you say that, a lot of the family heirlooms these days are not physical objects, at least in my experience and with my friends, it's not so much here's great Aunt Trudy's China set. It's every year we celebrate 4th of July in this specific way, or we always do X at Christmas, or, you know, it seems like that's actually more central to generations now than in history. <laughs> yeah, because... Not a lot of us want the China yeah. anymore. It's the stuff. I mean, it's beautiful. It's lovely. Yeah. I can't put it in my dishwasher. So right. thanks. I don't want to destroy the pretty thing with my, my normal life. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's the, the other part of it is that there is the switch generationally between like we get out all of these decorations and spend weeks at a time doing this. That... Mm -hmm. That is when you had three or four kids who came over to help. That is when one of you was home most of the time. Mm -hmm. That is when the outside hobbies took less time or took a different kind of time. Mm -hmm. um, my, my holiday decoration right now is really super limited because that's what works for my family. And even without COVID, I rarely have guests. Mm -hmm. So I've, I don't bust out the China. Yeah. 
it's 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 very different now I mean even in one generation my mom was so good at holidays we had rubbermaid tubs upon rubbermaid tubs of decorations she had special recipes and a lot of those things I like to continue but it's like there are more decorations in her garage than closet space in a in a young person's home like it's just <laughs> it's different now and she used to like you said spend weeks you know putting stuff up on the roof you know putting a giant santa cut out and it's like in modern times especially after covid it feels so much more important to say can i just see my friends and can we celebrate togetherness and yeah. you know kind of returning to those roots i will i will make my grandmother's cookies and I will watch a Die Hard, and we will all be under the same blanket and snuggling, mm -hmm. and that's what I want to take forward. That's Time that includes rest, mm -hmm. eating the things that smell like my childhood in a yep. nice way. Yeah, thinking back on all on my Christmases with my family, I remember the decorations and all the work my mom put into them. But my 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 memories are Christmas Day pajamas sitting comfy in the living room, all throwing, you know, wrapping paper in a pile. And that's the holiday to me. It's not, you know, the, the lights and the, all of those things. Right. But I had to learn that as an adult. And I think that was only really recently that I felt like I wasn't doing it wrong all the time. Oh yeah. Cause everybody has to figure out like it was, it is, it is a magical time in somebody's life when they realize the Memorial Day picnic does not put itself together, right? <laughs> like it doesn't just show up that day um, and that you need to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and that yes. changes and then it leans into your own personal strengths. Mm -hmm. Like, do you like to cook? Great. Let's picnic. Don't like to cook? Let's go to the parade. Yeah. Um. Let's see what where, where do I want? I feel like I could talk <laughs> to you about this stuff forever because the generational differences, the ideas of like ancient celebrations versus kind of how we look at them today, but and individual rituals. I wanted to kind of loop back a little bit because we haven't talked a whole lot about individual rituals. Um, but I I think it's important to realize this is such a big spectrum and you don't have to celebrate or acknowledge everything with a huge to do right um like for me I have a ritual for when I'm journaling that I always light a black candle and a white candle to remind myself that we are all shadow and we're all light we are all nobody's perfect nobody's evil we are all both and that's like it takes me five seconds it's not a super you know, I don't say like a chant with it or anything, but that ritual always grounds me back to my purpose for that. Yeah. Do you have recommendations for people who want to, um, you know, maybe identify places in their own life where celebrations or rituals would be useful? I think, and I think that this is something that came kind of to light for a lot of people over, over this last year. Um, once we were no longer transitioning in and out of spaces that we were like, wow, my work life balance is now just this all big swampy pile of stuff that all happens from this one chair all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that was a challenge for people. So at an individual level, thinking about where the transitions in your day are and where they should be, um, I take great offense at the mentality that everybody always has the ability to get up just 20 minutes earlier in their day so they can do morning pages or do yoga or go for a run or start that new sourdough bread loaf or whatever. Right. Uh, we are not infinitely made up of 20 minutes increments earlier in the day. In fact, some of us don't think until 11 a.m., no matter when our eyes open. And so trying to be respectful of that sort of thing. Yeah. So thinking about those transitions, I would also move that kind of transition awareness uh, towards like corporate and organizational stuff. 
if your break room is the OSHA posters and the equal opportunity posters mm -hmm. and the, you know, keeping track of how many millions of dollars of product has been stolen from your organization and what you're supposed to do if you see your colleagues stealing stuff, that's, that's not a break room. That's your timeout space. Yes. And that's different. That's such a good way to put it. <laughs> and that is true for where people walk in and out when they work someplace too. Like what, and I think the part that people miss who run organizations is that when people leave the building, they're not leaving work, they're going home. Mm -hmm. And so what's the last thing you say to the people who work for you as they go home instead mm -hmm. of just leave their productive hours for your organization? Right. So yeah. back to your actual question. Sorry. No, it, I've got all, all of relevant. these soap boxes around me. I just haven't had a chance <laughs> to climb up on all of them yet. Um, so when you're looking for things, think about the things you want to remind yourself of. Like you said, the candles being both light and shadow. Think about where those reminders serve you best. Think about where those transitions happen in your day and be mindful and honor the places where your energy is low mm -hmm. and don't assume your energy must always be good. Mm -hmm. energy waxes and wanes and you have to have things that serve both of those yeah in my own home I have a grid for if I am uh, high energy and high braininess versus low energy you know if I am happy and feeling brainy this is the kind of stuff I do if I am tired and not feeling brainy this is the kind of stuff that I can do so that I can honor the ways that I feel when I feel that way. And I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. That, that very much rings back with Casey Davis's, her, her uh, closing duties, especially. I think that's such a good ritual. Uh, in short, basically she has a list of things to do that she does like at the end of every, not at the end of the day, but when she's ready to clock out from the day's tasks, she loads the dishwasher and wipes off the countertop and like three or four things really simple not and a sets full... up her coffee that's my favorite and one. sets up her coffee yes because it is about taking care like genuinely taking care of yourself and that means taking care of future you and you know setting yourself up to feel differently and being compassionate about the way you feel right now I think that energy matrix is really important for people to realize I know for me I used to get in these phases where I'd make like a huge list and be like, here's my new morning routine. I'm going to yoga and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this. And then the first morning I woke up feeling like crap. Not only did I not feel like I could do it, I felt like a failure. Right. But if I'd given myself space to say, okay, well on a low energy day, what if I just do these two things? Right. Or if I just pick two. Yep. Um, and it, it, I, I think it is difficult to, uh, express how life-changing that attitude can be applied to you know anything that you're doing applied to this applied to home care applied to work and I think and I think the the addition to that mm -hmm. is that there is a lot and it particularly comes up in in women trying to help other women find their strength and that sort of stuff the idea of you should give yourself permission to whatever I personally kind of resist that phrasing mm -hmm. and much more go with, you have the authority to do this because asking for permission is still a conversation with some out of body other about what you are and are not allowed to do. And when you're developing rituals, when you're developing your traditions, when you are figuring out that you no longer are at 40 or 45 years old, going to travel to three different states in five different days so that everybody can hug you because that's what you've always done. Nobody needs to give you permission for that. You have right. the authority to make that decision in your life. And that for me was a change in mindset that was really meaningful because it made it a lot easier to not articulate the invisible other who's supposed to grant me this permission yeah. And instead just rely on myself. Much more of a, a basis of self-empowerment and, and allowing your intuition to really rule how your life is, is working instead of, oh, like you said, like traveling three to three different families in five days. That's the kind of stuff that when you say it, 
people go, oh, that must be Christmas or that must be a holiday because that's, we know, like we all associate putting yourself through a whole bunch of stress with some of these traditions. And yeah, there's no, you have the authority to change things. So they work for you. You don't right. need permission. That's a great. And you absolutely have to, you know, take care of grandma, you know, make sure right. you see her, but really there's nothing magical about some of the days that we decide to do that to ourselves. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to the, the large sort of universally, obviously not universally, but widely celebrated things. Um, you know, just the assumption that, okay, well, everybody will be off because it's Christmas or everybody. It's like society is so much more individualized. And I think it would be a really beautiful world if we, you know, I would love to hear about somebody's holiday instead of hear somebody, you know, commiserate and whine about traveling during the holidays, right? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't the conversations be so much better if there were, we were learning about, if it was more diverse, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Well, and I think the other part of that is, wouldn't it be neat if there was a city that would commit to big picnics and lots of, lots of joyful games and that sort of stuff and absolutely 100% pinky swear, zero fireworks for 4th of July. How many folks, how many people do you think who deal with some form of PTSD would be like, I am going to no fireworks town for the 4th of July and I am going to have a picnic and I am going to have my nervous little ridiculous dog with me and mm -hmm. we are all going to sleep well that night. Yeah. Because the thing is we struggle even to adapt to the realities versus what it always felt like. You mm -hmm. know, 4th of July was a picnic and I live in Georgia. 4th of July is about as miserably hot as a day can be. When I grew up in Chicago, that was like hot. I had no idea what it was going to feel like now. Yeah. Um, but so many people are troubled by fireworks. Yeah. And we don't ever create a place that says, out of honor and respect for your service to our country, this whole place is going to be quiet. Yeah. It would, I mean, it's kind of appalling that we don't it's kind of appalling that in our celebration of our nation and of our our you know the sacrifices people have made and continue to make we we, we terrorize them. ptsd <laughs> we, we terrorize them like that's horrible but because just holidays are holidays it's accepted you do it the way you do it you just keep doing it so right. i think you know large large scale it would just thinking about that world and how different it would be is really inspiring and and then kind of reconnecting it like as we form our own rituals for the intent of our lives to build towards that world building a better world hey we're on theme <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody who's watching this wants to build beautiful fireworks that don't go bang like i don't mind sparkly stuff in the sky i think that's real real pretty um but without the bang would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Let's maybe normalizing laser light shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could do that. There's, there's all, and I guess we're, we're running late on time, but I think my maybe last <laughs> um, little thing that I want to touch on is how fun this can be. Like how okay. fun you can make your events when you're not just going by what you should be doing. Do you have any like, favorite examples of like the coolest event or, you know. Like. So, so I have, I was, um, I've had two sets of in-laws in my life. I was widowed in my late twenties and that group of my family is still a really super important part of, of my life. And that has, that part of my family celebrates chicken day and chicken day happens in the summer. And it is, uh, my first husband was one of five children and the wow. other four have survived and they have who are people who are now adults, children of their own. And there were spring birthdays and fall holidays and winter holidays and no reason to get together in the summer. Right. And so there was then chicken day 
And it was a all called event. Like you, we would move chicken day if we had to, but you will be at chicken day. It will mm-hmm. not surprisingly include uh, pasta and chicken. Um, <laughs> but it was just the most clear cut holiday of my life yeah. because you came to chicken day because we don't see each other enough. So come here, share a meal, be together, perhaps consume adult beverages in vats. Um, <laughs> in excess. But, <laughs> but that but, like, that's fun, right? You're not just there right. to drink because you don't want to be at that party, <laughs> right. which is a lot of holiday parties. <laughs> but, but yeah, just to take the thing and just start announcing that it is a day. I also, uh, my mother created cake day, which had kind of the same sort of vibe. Um, it was a different kind of retirement party where it was just simply like, we're going to have cake. 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 And then we had cake and it had a lot more energy to it than this person is retiring today. Everybody come to the break room at 315 and have a piece of cake. Make sure you sign the card. Mildred right. has it back behind the counter. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but cake day, anything that you're willing to put energy into will give you energy back. And it's often the same kind of energy you put into it. So if you put in the, like, get the big bottle of whiskey, because dear God, we've got to go to grandma's again. Um, that's that you'll get that back too. That's such a good point and a lesson for all sorts of facets of life. Um, <laughs> just a really, really important uh, concept. Thank you so much for talking events with me today. I swear I could let, ask you a million more questions and just, I'm sure that we will geek out about this off stream in the future. Um, I don't know if you remember, I don't remember the TikTok song, the, the song that people use for their name thing. Do you remember which one it is? Chat was asking. Oh, yeah, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I'll try to look it up afterwards. And if I, I'll put it in the world builders discord. Yeah. Um, Cause that like it's TikTok doesn't really tell you that kind of thing along the bottom, a sound will scroll and you might see the song title in it, but we'll figure it out. But it is absolutely beautiful and it completely fits. I don't think that's what it was designed to do, but it is, Yeah, it is no. absolutely beautiful. Yeah, definitely. So we will, we'll try to hook you guys up with that TikTok trend. Um, let's do a very quick lightning round okay. at the end of our show. We occasionally ask guests some very straightforward questions. Okay. Uh, just first thing comes to your mind. If we are going out and you would like a beverage, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, whatever the occasion, what is your go-to? Maker's Mark Neat. Maker's Mark Neat. Got it. Now, meal of choice. If you could have delivery or even dine in if you could just like having a stressful day here's my favorite place to, or, or my favorite meal nabiyaki udon Ooh, good choices <laughs> all right a great read that you would recommend evolution man or how i killed my father uh Thanks. which is hard to get and the funniest book i have ever read in my life how, how what was it evolution man or how I ate my father. Sorry, or I how I, hate, the how I ate my father. How I All ate right. my father. That intrigued, very intrigued. <laughs> and then it, you're kicking the on pre, the prehist. Uh, uh, okay, so the prehistoric beginnings of high jump is part of the book. Oh, I, yeah. I now I'm going to have to read this book. It seems it's <laughs> difficult to read and fascinating, or like. <laughs> All right, so you're scrolling Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, whatever. What show are you popping on to watch? Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Classic, classic. Uh, Ten and Tom Baker are my doctors. Ten and Tom Baker. Okay. All right. I think ten. Ten. David Tennant. Yeah, ten is Tennant. Yeah, I'm. I saw Eccleston and Tennant, and I got to the Rose arc, and I couldn't anymore. So I'm not a Doctor Who <laughs> person. <gasps> Let me lean against the wall. Oh God. I can't. I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I turned off the TV after I watched that episode and was like, I'm <laughs> feeling so much right now. <laughs> All right. Last lightning round question. If you could sit down and have a conversation with anyone real or imagined alive or dead, who would it be? 
Varian Fry, who was a New Yorker in the 1940s, who managed to get more people out of Vichy, France, including people like Max Ernst, uh, and actually rescued more people out of uh, Hitler areas, like the bad spots, uh, than Oscar Schindler and died in the second edition of his own biography, like surrounded by those pages. And in the police report, it said it was a work of fiction. Huh, I'm gonna have to read about this guy too. I'm learning so much. I, I, now I need to learn about both of them. What was the first name? Varian, V-A-R-I-A-N. V-A-R-I-A-N. Fry, F-R-Y. Definitely going to look that up. Thank you so much, Heather, for this delightful conversation. I am sure we will chat again. We've got Geeks Doing Good coming up and all sorts of events that we will probably loop you and snag you along for. So I would um, love to everybody, come along. Thanks in chat. Uh, thank you all for being here. And our sign off word of the day is going to be celebration moose. <laughs> We always have a sign off word so we know when chat has caught up. Celebration or celebrating moose, party moose. Is this a dessert or an animal? I'm very challenged right <laughs> <Both>. now. <laughs> and I think we're offline. <laughs>